Hello everyone, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce uh, tonight's speaker. Um, it's such a fun topic. Um, it's it's going to be great, it's going to be hilarious. Um, but we all want to know what happens at the end. Um, and Henry Olders, Dr. Olders, is actually an electrical engineer. Um, but that's probably not the, the most important part of his training for this talk. Maybe it is, but he's also a, a doctor, a medical doctor. So he studied at uh, McGill uh, to obtain his uh, medical degree. Then he um, specialized in psychiatry and did geriatric psychiatry at the uh, University of Nottingham. Uh, and so then he had all these uh, specialty um, and his knowledge with him. And he practiced in the hospitals back, uh, back in Montreal um, at the Jewish General, uh, where he was director of uh, geriatric uh, psychiatry. Is that correct? Uh, no, that was at Douglas Hospital. At the Douglas. <laughs> I thought I could do it without looking at my notes. But uh, <laughs> maybe my notes are wrong. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so for, for many years, so he, and he uh, also uh, had um, teaching responsibilities at McGill, so he had many hats uh, to wear. Um, and so it's a great pleasure to, uh, to have him. Uh, there's one thing, so what, looking at his CV, he had a very uh, so active also academic research uh, record. Um, and I could be very jealous of this record, but there's one thing, one thing that I, so we need to talk. Um, he said at the end that he's um, riding tandem bicycle with his wife, and I could never get my wife to do that, so I want to know how you <laughs> <laughs> So with that, I very much look forward to your talk. Thank you very much for that introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here, and it's always a pleasure to have a full house. Uh, you notice these things I have in my ears? They're a hearing aid, but also if I get too boring, I can just play my music and maybe watch, uh, <laughs> watch some videos. But uh, you see the topic, why we get old and die, and what to do about it. Now, the diseases of aging include cancer, uh, heart disease, dementia, arthritis, cataracts, osteoporosis, stroke, oh, and type 2 diabetes. So it's likely that all of us have relatives or friends with one or more of these afflictions, maybe even ourselves. As a physician and engineer, I've been looking for answers. What causes these disorders and what can we do to prevent them? Recently, finding some answers has become particularly important. Uh, my dear wife, Helen, was diagnosed with colon cancer and was operated on uh, a year ago last March. She's had chemotherapy, uh, which ended up not working very well, and she's now on a research protocol of immunotherapy, but uh, because cancer is a condition of aging, then the research that I'm doing in this area has taken on an added urgency. But I have to say, what I've learned so far has been very surprising, and it's also made me very hopeful. So I'm quite excited to be able to share it with you tonight. Now, I like to talk, and my daughter rolls her eyes and said, Daddy, oversharing, when I go into too much detail. So I've worked to reduce this presentation down to the bare essentials, and hopefully not too many boring slides. But uh, here's my story. Since grade school, I've been overweight. Now it affected my participation in sports, it affected my self-esteem, even my relationships. And uh, after my first child was born in 1970, I quit smoking and I added on 10 pounds. And po possibly some of you are, uh, uh, have had a similar experience. But in 1972, I read this book by a New York City cardiologist, Dr. Robert Atkins. Mm -hmm. Dr. Atkins' Diet Revolution. The high calorie way to stay thin forever. Now, at the time, there was a great deal of controversy about this uh, diet. It was condemned by pretty well the entire medical establishment. But I'm a contrarian, so I said, well, if everyone pans it, maybe there's something to it. Right? So uh, I looked up the references in his book, and I was pleasantly surprised. No alternative facts, no fake news. So I started on his diet, and guess what? It worked. Not only did I rapidly lose 20 pounds, but I was able to keep off that weight as long as I stayed on the diet. 
So why did this diet work? And anyone who's familiar with dieting knows that <coughs> dieting to lose weight is, you know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's tough. So why would this diet work? As the subtitle suggests, Dr. Atkins believed you could be thin even when eating lots of calories. But what you ate was critical. Now, as Dr. Atkins explained in his book, eating carbohydrates, carbs for short, stimulates our bodies to make insulin. Insulin, as you will know, is a hormone which tells our cells to absorb sugar from the bloodstream. Now, fat cells turn that absorbed sugar into fat, and muscle cells turn it into glycogen, maybe a little fat too, uh, but uh, without insulin, for example, if you eat very little carbohydrate, you will not produce very much insulin at all. And as a con consequence, you cannot put on weight. And in fact, uh, in a situation where you have little insulin, your body converts fat to energy to use. Uh, so you would lose weight, and that's the principle behind the Atkins diet. But, uh, although Dr. Atkins claimed that his diet was a revolution, no such thing. I mean, low-carb dieting for weight loss had already been written about in a, uh, in not quite a book, but a long essay form, as far back as the 1800s, uh, by somebody who had tried a whole bunch of other things without any success. Yeah, it's dark. I want you to pay attention to me, but thanks for pointing it out. <laughs> Yes, it's dark here too. <laughs> good, good pickup. Okay, so, uh, uh, but of course, in the 1800s, they hadn't yet discovered insulin. Insulin was successfully isolated only in uh, 1922. Canadian discovery, no less. Uh, Banting and Best at the University of Toronto, they managed to extract insulin from a dog pancreas and used it to treat a young boy with diabetes. They saved his life. Now this was huge. It was Nobel Prize huge. Now prior to this game-changing discovery, children with what we now call type 1 diabetes, they would invariably die at quite a young age from their disease. Uh, the disease is also called juvenile onset diabetes or uh, sometimes insulin-dependent <coughs> diabetes. You know, I wish the doctors would just get together and. You uh, and agree to call it one thing. Wouldn't that be nice? So if you had one of these kids prior to insulin, no matter how much they ate, they would gradually lose weight and die, essentially, of starvation. Without insulin, not only could they not put on weight, but they would lose weight. And that, of course, is the principle of the Atkins diet. If you eat in such a way that you produce very little insulin, then you will lose weight. Okay, so... After 1922, when insulin treatment became common, many lives were saved. It really was huge. But the takeaway message I want you to get is that it's not what you, it's, sorry, it's not how much you eat, as Dr. Atkins said in the subtitle of his book, it's what you eat that counts, both for weight loss and for weight gain. Because what you eat controls how much insulin your body produces. So, you know, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Okay, so what do we eat? Well, here's the nitty gritty. Our diets are made up of just three things macronutrients protein, <coughs> fat, and carbohydrates. Now, eating carbs stimulates insulin secretion. <clears throat> Protein does as well, but less. Fat by itself does not stimulate insulin secretion. So if you eat a lot of carbs, you will produce a lot of insulin, which will stimulate a lot of fat storage and possibly lead to overweight and obesity, but not in everybody, because genetics plays a role too. So what are carbs? Well, sugars, starches, and, well, Actually, that's it. It's sugars and starches. We have uh, added sugars, 
We have natural sugars that are found in fruits and in many vegetables. And then there's starches found in foods like breads, pastas, grains, beans, root vegetables like potatoes. Okay, I, I lied actually. Sorry, besides sugars and starches, there's also a kind of carbohydrate that, called fiber. But because it's not normally digestible, by humans at least, it's not considered a nutrient and it's just called fiber. Now, it's important to note that Dr. Atkins said to replace carbs with fiber from fruits and vegetables, with dietary fats and oils, and with some protein. But starting about 1985, doctors began saying that fats in our diet were bad. Do you guys remember that? Fats are bad for you, unhealthy. Uh, fats contribute to cancer. Fats contribute to heart disease. Now these doctors caused the American people, and Canadians too, to have a fat phobia, terrible fear. And fat phobia reigned for at least 20 years. It, uh, not just in the United States, but actually it spread to a good part of the world. And certainly Canadians were badly infected. And even now, many dietitians read the newspaper, right, you know, and, and uh, I can't remember what day it is, but the Gazette has articles by nutritionists and so on, and they publish articles, low fat. You know, they still believe in this fat is bad mantra. So people trying the Atkins diet, 95, 1985 on, they said, well, we can't add fat, we can't use fat to replace the carbs that we're supposed to cut back on. Let's replace those carbs with proteins. The problem is that proteins do not work for weight loss. So the Atkins diet fell out of favor. It actually didn't work all that well. I mean, could still work, depending upon how you played it. But well before this fat phobia, in 1981, I graduated from McGill in med school. And we're, you know, we did learn about diabetes, and we learned about insulin. And uh, we learned about type 1 diabetes. Now, what we learned was that, at that time, Type 1 diabetics make up less than 10% of the people with diabetes. The vast majority, more than 90%, and this is still increasing, are people with what's called type 2 diabetes. Or it was at the time called adult onset diabetes, but now kids are getting it, so we can't really call it adult onset diabetes. Most people refer to it as type 2 diabetes. Now, um, when type 2 diabetes first start, most of the people who develop it are obese when they first develop type 2 diabetes. So how did they get obese? What were they doing? Well, the short answer is they were eating too much starch and sugar and combined with their particular genetic makeup led them to become overweight and possibly obese. Now, because the sugars and starches that they were eating stimulates insulin. The Im insulin stimulates uptake of glucose, sugar, from the bloodstream for fat cells to convert to fat. Now, a lot of the fat it gets stored around the waist, and it's called central obesity, and metabolically, that's the worst sort of fat you can have. But as I said, many obese people never develop diabetes. And that's because they have a different genetic makeup. But for those who do become diabetic, our medical school teachers, this was in the late 1970s, told us that it was high insulin levels that caused insulin resistance. Okay, So high insulin levels lead to insulin resistance. That's what we learned in medical school. Insulin resistance, well, what does that mean? It means that fat cells and muscle cells no longer respond in the same way to the signal from insulin to take glucose out of the bloodstream. And so the level of glucose in the bloodstream rises, 
and eventually spills over into the urine and uh, causes the symptoms of, for many people, first tell you that you have diabetes when you have to urinate a lot and you're thirsty all the time. Now, the idea that high levels of insulin could cause insulin resistance, which is what we were taught in, high, in med school at the time, to me that made perfect sense. Not only was this like a negative feedback system like I'd studied in engineering school eight years or so before, but it also fitted exactly with what we knew about other types of tolerance and dependence and resistance. For example, opiate uh, dependence. If you give somebody opiates regularly, they will need ever-increasing amounts to get the same effect. That's opiate resistance, right? Same thing with benzodiazepines or with barbiturates. These things, if you give it repeatedly at a high enough dose, people will develop resistance. High levels of the substrate induce receptor resistance. That's the principle. Okay. But during the 1980s, again, that principle, which made a lot of sense and which had a lot of explanatory value, it started to morph. And in retrospect, that change was brought about largely by the efforts of one very persuasive researcher, Dr. Gerald Reven. Now, Dr. Reven said that insulin resistance was a cause of high insulin levels. In fact, he turned the cause and effect relationship on its head, 180 degree reversal. And he called the high insulin levels, which he said were caused by the insulin resistance, he called that compensatory hyperinsulinemia. Okay. Now, I was, and I remain, flabbergasted by this idea. First of all, it doesn't make anywhere near as much sense. Now, you know, to his credit, if you have insulin resistance, it's very true that the pancreas has to make and secrete more insulin to overcome that insulin resistance. That's a compensatory hyperinsulinemia part, but that's only part of it. And it begs the question, well, what causes the insulin resistance in the first place? If it isn't high insulin levels, if it isn't hyperinsulinemia, what does cause insulin resistance? Now, and even worse than my being flabbergasted is that the consequences for people who were caught in this paradigm shift was that they no longer had any control over their own diabetes. <coughs> Whereas with the previous paradigm, if you were aware that eating sugars and starches to excess caused high levels of insulin, and high levels of insulin led to insulin resistance, which is known as diabetes, you could, and I know people that do this. My daughter, who's a GP in Ottawa, does this. There's a Dr. Jason Fung, who's a nephrologist in Toronto, who routinely does this as a website. Uh, so what you can, if, if you can convince somebody to cut back on the carbs in their diet, a la Atkins, actually, but without all the protein, then their type 2 diabetes, in many cases, will quickly reverse over a matter of several days. They can stop any diabetic medication, and they will no longer have the disease. Because it's not a disease. It's essentially a form of carbohydrate poisoning. So, but if you turn the paradigm around and say, well, the high insulin levels are caused by insulin resistance, and the insulin resistance, well, what causes that? We're not too sure. There's a bunch of theories out there. But it means you have no control anymore. So it's taking control away from, from uh, people with this condition. Now, when I ask experts, and I've been to, you know, I, I used to go to the endocrinology grand rounds at the Jewish and so on, and I would ask these people when they're talking about type 2 diabetes and insulin, I would say, well, you, you know, what causes, uh, if, if it isn't high insulin levels, what's causing this insulin resistance? And they would say things like, I have to read this because I can't remember. 
they mumble sort of about inflammation and obesity and insufficient exercise, high fat diets, and other things causing the insulin resistance. And so I would say, well, where's the research? Show me the research. And you know, if, if you, any of you are on ResearchGate, you can check out this long thread of where I asked this question. And people come back with you know, nonsense answers, bad research. I knock down the research, provide other research, and they come back with more stupid things. And eventually they say, oh, it's too complicated for psychiatrists to understand. <laughs> <laughs> really? <coughs> okay, but uh, I mean, they do have a good point. Why would I, a geriatric psychiatrist, even care about this stuff? So now it turns out that there's a convergence between my personal interest in dealing with overweight, uh, the story I told you, and my professional interest in dealing with a condition that I saw very commonly in my line of work. What condition is that? Dementia. Okay, I see dementia a lot for two reasons. One, dementia frequently causes behavioral or emotional disturbances, and those are the, the province of the psychiatrist. <coughs> and two, dementia is extremely common in old age. Well, just how common is it? Have a look at this one. Uh, so this is a graph of the prevalence in percent of the population versus age of uh, the cohort in years. And the black line, which goes up steeply, that's the curve for Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that beyond a certain age, it's pretty well linear, right? Now, I'm going to uh, do a little thought experiment. I'm going to extrapolate from this prevalence curve. So first we're going to lengthen the horizontal axis, then the vertical axis. We're going to add some tick marks. We're going to add some labels. Okay, now I want to see at what age the prevalence would be 50% of the population for Alzheimer's. Okay, so follow along here. Uh, first we'll draw a horizontal line at the 50% mark. Uh, we're going to extend the Alzheimer's plot. This is extrapolation. And then I'm going to drop a vertical from the point where that intersects a 50% line. Right? And then I'm just going to measure along the bottom axis. <laughs> right? Okay, follow me? Yeah. So at age 101, 50% of the population has Alzheimer's. And of course, it's higher at higher ages. So if you're over 100, if you don't have Alzheimer's, you're abnormal. Right? More than 50% of the population, you can't call that abnormal. So having Alzheimer's is normal at, in that age group. That's important because one of the things we learned in medical school, press the button on the top. <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Right? Anyway, for people over 100 years of age, dementia is not abnormal. So you can't call something abnormal if uh, it's more than half the people. And in medical school, we are also taught that if you have a deleterious condition, which uh, evolution doesn't select against, so in other words, it continues, it's probably because that condition even though it's deleterious, it may confer some evolutionary advantage. Follow me? So the example that they used in med school was um, sickle cell anemia, right? Now sickle cell anemia uh, makes the condition, uh, it's a genetic condition, and it makes red blood cells appear like sickles, as in this uh, slide here. And it's, it's quite common in uh, places like Africa and around the Mediterranean. And it remains common. And why is it so common? Well, the explanation we heard is that the malaria parasite, which is also endemic to those regions and which kills red blood cells, uh, red blood cells with a sickle trait have a resistance against the malaria parasite. So 
this horrible image here it reminds me of Alien. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Uh, okay, so let's just go back to dementia after that uh, sort of detour. So if dementia is so common, more than 50% of the population over 100, you have to ask yourself, what possible advantage could having dementia confer? Using that same theory about the malaria and the sickle cell anemia. What possible advantage could it be to have dementia? Any ideas? Okay, then I'll tell you. So, oh, wait a minute. You mean to get your old? You don't worry anymore. <laughs> Good point. Uh, you can't remember what you should be worried about, right? <laughs> okay, now, <coughs> I want you to think about what would happen to an animal in the wild if they developed dementia. Mm -hmm. What would happen? Yeah, it's going to get killed, you know. Very quickly it would become prey to some predator. Yeah. The predator would have a happy meal and the uh, prey not so happy. But that's what would happen almost right away. And in fact, the same is true for any of the other conditions of aging. If they happen in the wild, take cataracts or uh, osteoarthritis or, uh, or, or tooth, teeth falling out or hearing loss or uh, uh, arthritis, I mentioned that, heart disease, stroke, you name it. Any of those conditions, if it happened to an animal in the wild, that animal would be dead meat very, very fast. And in fact, so fast that for a long, long time, people said, well, animals in the wild don't age. <laughs> <laughs> but certainly, if you put them into captivity, and you all know from having had dogs and cats and so on, well, certainly animals age. They just, if they're protected from predators, you'll see all the aging. Right? Just like humans, they age too. So then you have to ask the question, well, if, uh, uh, if uh, these conditions of aging are so common, and I just use the dementia to make that example, but could evolution have built in these conditions for some reason? Although we know that it leads to quick death in the wild, could it be that evolution built in conditions of aging because of some ulterior motive, and the motive not being just to kill off that person? Because clearly, uh, diseases of aging are not helpful for the person who has them. So are they helpful at all? Well, here's my take. I believe that by knocking off the eldest members of a species, and that's what conditions of aging do, they don't affect the youngest people by and large, although there are exceptions, children do get cancer. But most of the time, the conditions of aging affect the eldest people. So if, if this were to be evolution's way of knocking off the eldest, members of a society or of a species, uh, what purpose might that serve? Well, one way to look at it is that, uh, you know, there's only a limited amount of resources and space and food and uh, room for waste products and so on in a given area. And so uh, we've known since the days of Darwin that in a given area, the population of a species remains quite constant over time. You know, there's some in-migration, some out-migration, the numbers of predators rises and falls, the amount of food rises, the climate changes. So there are fluctuations, but it tends to be stable. So uh, people need to die, because if the young people are coming along to replace them, something has got to give. Now, why the elderly people? Why not just pick at random, like happens with bacteria, you know? Bacteria do die, but it's sort of random. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. It's just more or less random. Why not in populations that age? Well, because if the eldest die, that means the youngest have the best chance of survival. And keep in mind that each generation is more fit to its environment. It's more evolutionarily suited to its environment because it's had the most recent evolutionary change, which is driven by competition. So in order to ensure the survival of the youngest generation, evolution built it in to knock off the eldest generation. And uh, 
Now, I don't see this as surprising. Has anyone read this book by Nassim Taleb? He's a philosopher and an economist, and he made uh, quite a pile of money from the uh, 2008 uh, crash. But he spelled out in this book how general this idea is. Okay, he, for example, the Montreal restaurant scene. I mean, many of you here, I'm sure, eat out a lot because eating out in Montreal is great. We have a marvelous restaurant scene. You can get all sorts of varieties. Quality of the food is high. Prices are good. You can find BYOB places. There's a lot to like about the restaurant scene in Montreal compared to some other places. What makes Montreal have this great restaurant scene? Well, uh, it's competition, right? A restaurant which is not up to snuff, or the prices are too high, or for whatever reason, too noisy, eventually goes out of business. And in fact, it has to go out of business because you can't have too many restaurants. There's not enough of a market for too many restaurants. So the only way to get a good, thriving restaurant scene is for restaurants to die away, to disappear. And that's exactly what I think happens with the conditions of aging. Same principle, not necessarily competition, but the, uh, uh, we as a species, we as humanity or as a community or whatever label you choose, we get better through evolution because the eldest among us die and so that the youngest can thrive. So the conditions of aging are not there for individual needs, they're there for the the benefit of the species. So here's an interesting factoid. I mentioned that known, it's been known since uh, Charles Darwin. What, what they knew was that if the numbers remain constant then, it implies that the average lifespan of members of a species has to be inversely proportional to the reproductive rate of that species. And that's very important, and as I said, known way back in the 1800s. So this is nothing new, but it seems to have been very forgotten by people. I don't know why, but how often have you heard that the reason why we have a high life expectancy in Canada is because we spend so much on health care? Anyone? Well, that's nonsense, actually, because in the States, they spend even more on health care, and their life expectancy is considerably lower. Okay, so it, it doesn't necessarily relate. And if you draw, drew up a graph of different countries and per capita spending on health care and longevity, you'd find that it's almost a flat line and then it goes up really steeply at one point. So it's, it's not at all proportional, but life expectancy is proportional to, well, inversely proportional to reproductive rate. And that's important because if you look at any of the places, including Quebec, where life expectancy is high, a reproductive rate is not even enough to replace the population. It's well below uh, the, it's a little under 2.2 offspring per female that is needed to maintain the population level. And that's why, uh, well, I'm, this isn't a political lecture, but uh, we need immigrants just to replace the population. Okay. So, um, okay, where am I? Now, so, and you can show by looking at various species that if for some reason the reproductive rate changes, the lifespan will change too, mm -hmm. and vice versa. Now, uh, I explain that by saying that lifespan is under genetic control. And there are other reasons to believe that lifespan is under genetic control. For example, ex experiments with animals. You've heard of knockout mice? Well, a, a knockout mouse is uh, a strain of mice where a particular gene has been disabled. So that, that gene can no longer express the protein that it would normally express. So you have knockout mice which don't express a particular gene, and it turns out that depending upon which gene you knock out, you can get some experimental animals to live like twice as long as they usually do. Twice as long. I mean, 
that, again, is huge. And it really strongly suggests that lifespan is under genetic control. And if most of us die, you know, if it is an accident or an infection, most of us die these days, in Western societies anyway, from the conditions of aging, then, uh, and lifespan is under genetic control, that must mean that gen our genes cause the conditions of aging. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Now, is there anyone who disagrees with that as a sort of hypothesis? Because there has to be some environmental consideration in there, not just genetic. Well, yes, you're right. Obviously, uh, uh, environment plays a role, but through an interaction with our genetic makeup. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But there has to be some environmental component, not strictly genetic. Yes. No, I, I agree. I'm just saying that when uh, modifying even a single gene has such a huge impact on lifespan, uh, which goes far beyond an environmental effect, then a major control of our lifespan is going to, is likely to be this hypothesis, right? Um, so the timing of our death is controlled by our genes, and, you know, we don't just drop dead all of a sudden when we've reached the end. We develop some condition of aging, and there's typically a gradual decline, and then we die from that condition of aging. So that suggests that our genetic, our genes somehow uh, determine the onset, and together with environment, they determine the onset of these conditions of aging. Well, uh, and the environment is important because we have control over our environment, and we have very little control over our genes. So, uh, what can we do? Well, that's what this talk was about. Uh, where are we? So I, I brought all of that up and the preamble and so on because there's good reason to believe that insulin, which we talked about before, plays a major role in these conditions of aging. And why should that be? And you might also ask, well, what does dementia have to do with insulin? That's an excellent question. It turns out that people with uh, diabetes, and we know that type 2 diabetes, these people have high levels of insulin, whether it's caused by what they eat or whether it's caused, as uh, Reven and uh, people say, caused by insulin resistance. doesn't matter. They have high levels of insulin uh, circulating around in their bloodstreams. And uh, that those high levels of insulin are believed to contribute to the high incidence of dementia in people with type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Having diabetes actually doubles your risk for dementia. Mm -hmm. okay. And there is research suggesting that insulin resistance in the brain is a form of <laughs> dementia. Some people call it type 3 dementia. Figure it out. Sorry, type 3 diabetes, which is a dementia. Now, could it be that uh, high levels of insulin are causing both the type 2 diabetes and the dementia? If this is a possibility, what other things could insulin be causing or triggering? Because it has <coughs> far more than its weight simply in, than its role in weight gain, I mean, in obesity, and type 2 diabetes, and now dementia. It also has, like insulin goes back a long ways. It's been found in single-celled animals uh, that you can trace back to a billion years ago. So insulin is a, um, a very, very ancient molecule, and that tells you about its importance. It's not just about diabetes. It's probably about all sorts of things because single-celled animals don't get diabetes, and uh, they don't get dementia either, so insulin plays some other and we think bigger role. Uh, what role could that be? Well, at, uh, insulin is known to promote cancer. Okay. Insulin is known to promote inflammation. Well, how does it do that? Well, insulin is really a growth hormone as well as uh, the insulin, the glucose controlling hormone. It's a growth hormone. It stimulates 
cell division, and that's why it contributes to cancer. But there's actually another reason. If you have, like every cell in our bodies, and every, including bacterial cells and so on, we have repair and replacement mechanisms to repair the damage to our DNA that's caused by chemicals or caused by radiation and so on. There's an estimate, I don't know how good this estimate is, but at least one researcher says every cell in our body suffers at least a million hits of DNA damage every single 24 hours. You know, and we have trillions of cells, so that's an awful lot of DNA damage. And almost all of that damage is repaired. Because if it's not repaired, either it impairs the functioning of the cell and the cell dies, or in some cases, the cell becomes cancerous. And this happens uh, actually in the, uh, the, the repair and replacement mechanisms get turned down when the insulin level is high. So higher the insulin level, the worse the repair mechanisms function, and the higher the likelihood of cellular damage, which we call aging, or cancer, or inflammation, which and other associated conditions of aging. So we saw that, as in the type 1 diabetics, insulin is essential when you're young. Without insulin, you won't thrive, you won't be able to put on weight. In fact, zero insulin means you will just die at a young age. So insulin is essential when we're young. And at the same time, when we're older, if insulin triggers the conditions of aging, then this thing which is good for us turns out to be bad for us when we're older, at least bad at an individual level, because none of us likes to have dementia or cancer. But perhaps as a species, it's also good. There's more of a uh, uh, philosophical question there, I think. So the same hormone plays more than one role, and it's dependent upon the life stage of the individual, what role it actually plays. So that, that's bad news. But the good news is we can control the insulin levels in our bodies, and we can control it by what we eat, and of course how much we eat. Now, here's another insight. In the same way that insulin is good for you when you're young, but bad when you're old, the foods that stimulate insulin secretion are good for us when we're young and may turn out to be bad for us when we're old. It's just that principle of insulin. And vice versa. So uh, things which are bad when we're young may turn out to be good when we're old. <laughs> Uh, and it's not just foods, but also drinks. <laughs> so, but there's a caveat here. And the caveat is that no matter what your age, too much insulin is bad for you. Right? Because as we see with younger and younger kids, they're developing uh, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome that's called, and they're developing type 2 diabetes. Even pre-pubertal kids are developing type 2 diabetes now. I mean, this is a shame. And some people say, well, it's because they're drinking all of this uh, 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 high fructose corn syrup to sweeten drinks, or they're drinking too much drinks. And, and we as parents contribute. I mean, the, the started in California, but giving kids and adults orange juice as a routine for breakfast, not so good. You know, if somebody has low blood sugar uh, because of their diabetes, for example, the thing to do is to give them orange juice because it gives them a quick sugar boost. And if you get a quick sugar boost, that means you get a quick insulin boost. So giving people lots of orange juice and apple juice and so on, even though they may not contain any extra sugar, they may actually be bad for us, whether we're young or we're old because it may cause too much insulin. Now, th this business about something being good for you at one age and not so good for you at another age, and vice versa, that may help to explain why scientists keep on flip-flopping about whether something is good for you. Coffee is an example. You know, coffee is bad at one time, in another study, coffee is good, then it's bad again, then it's good again. Fats, same thing. In 
19, uh, late 1980s. Fats were bad, started with saturated fats and all fats and only um, um, uh, polyunsaturated fats and then trans fats and now fats except trans fat are good again. So make up your mind. <laughs> so now if you are skeptical about what I'm telling you, I fully expect that. If you weren't skeptical, because no one else says this, at least not that I can find, and I'm looking at the research regularly. No one else is saying this to you as far as I know. No one else is saying good for you when you're young, bad for you when you're older, and vice versa, and you can organize your life that way. Now, why not? Well, I don't know, but you were right to be skeptical, so, uh, and so ask questions. Now, um, so what can we do? Well, I'll tell a little story. You've heard of the Great Depression in the 1930s, dirty 30s it was called. Started in the United States and it became a worldwide phenomenon. Here's a photo from the era of these kids lined it up at basically an outdoor soup kitchen. Now, many people felt at the time that not getting enough food was so bad for your health that they wanted to convince the government of the day to increase food aid. So rather than people relying on food kitchens and volunteers and so on, the government should step in and provide more food aid because not getting enough food was so bad for your health. So they set out to do some experiments and they took mice and rats, gave them 70% of their usual caloric intake. Guess what happened? Exactly. You know this research. They lived up to 50% longer on 70% of their usual caloric intake and in good health. I mean, these researchers were not only surprised, but obviously they couldn't use this information to convince the government to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, this was research done in the 30s? Yeah, it started in the 30s. And it's been done in all sorts of experimental animals including humans who are trying to do this also, ever since. Now, the protocol, uh, uh, it's, it's called caloric restriction, and uh, you can uh, research that on PubMed. So, variety of animal species, and the results have been pretty consistent. Caloric restriction extends healthy longevity, but in many species it also impairs reproduction at the same time, like the animals are less fertile. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think the two are interrelated. The best explanation that I've found is that if a female animal uh, tries to have offspring when there's not enough food for survival, then, uh, well, sorry, if not enough food for reproduction, then that animal will be best off not reproducing, but going into a healthy mode, a healthy long-lived mode, to outweigh the bad times. And there's some extreme examples. There's a worm that they use called C. elegans for this kind of research. And uh, if you catch it at the right stage, uh, the, the worm normally only lives two weeks, so this is why it's very popular for longevity experiments. But um, if you hit it with caloric restriction at the right phase, it will convert to what's called a dower form. I can't remember, what, that's German, but I can't remember what it stands for. But in this stage, it actually lives for six months. So many times it's normal lifespan, but it's infertile. And then when you give it the normal food rations, it reverts back to uh, its normal form and lives out the remainder of its lifespan and of course is fertile again. So now that's really quite remarkable, but it points to this principle that if there's not enough food around, wait out the bad times and don't try to reproduce while you're waiting. And best if you wait out by staying healthy and by increasing longevity, because sooner or later good times are going to return, hopefully. Uh, so how does an organism know when there's enough food? Well, that's where the insulin comes in. Insulin is a signal. Because, as I showed you on that earlier slide, carbs in the diet, as well as protein, stimulate insulin. So insulin is a monitor of 
the food available in our diets. And that's why it probably plays this role of both being a growth hormone, so it acts to improve growth when we're young, when there's plenty of food, and it acts to knock us off faster when we're older, because evolution is built out of when there's enough food. And if there's not enough food, even when we're older, uh, hopefully we can live longer, as these experimental animals have shown. But perhaps we take a hit in our capacity to reproduce. My age, OK. I don't worry. Uh, so then you ask, well, what interventions are going to increase healthy lifespan? Here's an algorithm, OK? So what interventions will increase healthy lifespan, or what factors will suppress cancer, diabetes, heart disease, inflammation? I want to filter by whether that particular uh, piece of research information, whether insulin is involved, and in particular whether those things reduce insulin. And if so, I come up with a list of good things to do when you're old. That's my list. Okay. Now, part two of the algorithm. Look for factors which worsen outcomes for cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and so on. Now I'll filter by whether these factors increase insulin. <coughs> and the result is a list of things to avoid when you're old. Of course, as because we're talking about real life here, it's not quite so simple. Because it's not only insulin, there's another hormone. It's called insulin-like growth factor. And because it's insulin-like, that should tell you something. IGF-1 for short. Now, insulin, it's, it's like insulin because it, it's shaped enough like an insulin molecule so that it acts on the same receptors as insulin does, although not with the same potency. And conversely, insulin also acts on insulin-like growth factor 1 receptors. So there's a crosstalk between these two hormone systems. So the, together, the researchers refer to the two by the acronym IIS, which stands for Insulin and IGF Signaling. And they talk about the IIS pathway. because. Uh, and, and you'll hear terms like mTOR and uh, rapamycin and uh, DAF16 and DAF2, which refer to various genes and proteins and so on, which are involved in the signaling pathways that are often initiated, like they have at the head, insulin or insulin-like growth factor. So, like insulin, IGF-1 is important when we're young for us to grow and reproduce, but it appears also to contribute to the conditions of aging, such as cancer when we get older. And like insulin, IGF-1 secretion is to some extent controlled by what we eat. But in this case, it seems to be more controlled by our protein intake rather than carbohydrate intake. No, I've been giving variants of this talk for, by the way, I'm reading it for time. Okay. Uh, for, for years, and I'm trying to get the point across that things which are good for us when we're young may become bad for us when we're older, and vice versa. So the effect of some intervention depends on the age of the animal, and the people are now starting to look at that just this year. Here's an article of which. Uh, Activity of homologous genes can switch from complementary to antagonistic depending upon the life stage. In other words, they're comparing larval stage, juvenile stage, to old age. Okay, 2018 paper. Uh, and here's another example where they uh, describe in aged mice, which they uh, use the term late life mice, that uh, in late life mice, IGF-1 IGF signaling reduced life, no, sorry. In young male mice, reduction in IGF signaling reduced life expectancy, while for aged mice, both health span and lifespan were increased, but only for female mice. Okay. And then there are two areas of research which I think are going to be very fruitful in the uh, future. 
One is the gut microbiome, which I'm sure you've heard about. That's the bacteria and other microbes in our, uh, in, that inhabit our intestinal tract. And uh, recent evidence suggests that our microbiome can regulate our weight gain, our obesity, insulin sensitivity, and inflammation. So uh, possibly, possibly some of the things that we eat or ingest or medications and so on affect the gut microbiome. Uh, the second hot research area is microRNA. And here's the Wikipedia description of microRNA. A small non-coding RNA molecule containing about 22 nucleotides found in plants, animals, and some viruses that functions in RNA silencing and post-transcriptional regulation of gene expression. That's the Wikipedia description. Wow, that's heavy. Anyway, we're talking about a little string of genetic material which can modify whether our genes make proteins or not. That's it. <coughs> now, these microRNAs, they can be packaged into little vesicles, tiny little bubbles with a membrane around them. And as vesicles, they can travel through the bloodstream and be picked up, be directly picked up by other cells. So one cell can influence the, uh, the protein transcriptional behavior of genes in cells at a distance. Operate at a distance. But what's even more interesting is that plant microRNA in these vesicles can be absorbed by animals, and the plant microRNA can then influence the animal behavior. Now that's interesting because it suggests a pathway for, uh, besides insulin, for how foods may affect our health and our longevity. Because, you know, I'm, there are some things which really have very little to do with insulin, like uh, polyphenols and so on. Uh, okay, so, can I, no, you know, I'm running way over time and that's because I get so excited that I stray along the way from my script. So uh, we can continue. And I mean, what I was going to do now is get into some real practical nitty gritty. What to eat, what not to eat, which I'm sure that you're interested in and stuff that I've been doing since about five years and I've lost about 30 pounds and I feel good. And I, uh, uh, so this is working for me. I'm 70 and uh, feel like I'm younger, but of course, 50 is a new 70, so that may not mean anything. But uh, uh, I think we do need a break, so if, who wants me to continue, who wants to stop, and we'll just open it to questions. Okay, so everybody stand up and stretch. Okay, can we do that? No panic, because there are quite too many people in this room. Sorry? Yeah. We didn't know what's on your to-do list. Okay. Five, five minutes or less. Stretch. Okay. Okay, five minutes. So healthy aging. What to do, what not to do. So here's... Okay, I guess we need a long one. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. okay, let's go fast. This is the outline of what I want to okay. talk about. What to do. So diet, medication, supplements, other interventions, what to avoid. Guess what? Diet, medication, supplements, other things. <laughs> wow. Okay, so what about diet for healthy longevity? Eight subtopics. You can read it as fast as I can talk. Now, medications. These are five medications. There are actually others, but these are five important ones that have been well studied for their effect on longevity and for the conditions of aging. So, uh, can anyone see anything in common between any of these drugs? Blood thinners? Sorry? Are they blood, all blood thinners? No. 
No, in fact, well, aspirin acts like a blood thinner, but uh, three of them are actually anti-diabetic medications. Okay. That's the metformin, the uh, liraglutide, and the acarbose. Type 2 diabetes. No. <coughs> Supplements that I, these are ones that I take. Not every day, every other day. And we'll talk about a couple of them. Uh, now, here's some other interventions. <laughs> Exercise, union. Cool and cooked foods, cannabis, and stress. Okay, here are things to avoid. Sugars and starch in our diet. Avoid sugars and starches, as I said before. Avoid artificial sweeteners. High glycemic index foods, artificial trans fats. Medications to avoid, I, I'm not going to give you a list, but perhaps some guidelines. And one reason why not a list. Here's the disclaimer, okay? While I am a physician, I'm not your physician. So uh, I'm not going to dispense medical advice to any of you. If you have any questions about whether you should or should not take a particular medication or treatment, consult your own healthcare practitioner. I'm not dispensing medical advice. I'll talk only in generalities. Now, what about dietary supplements? Now, there are really no hard and fast rules in deciding which ones you want to consider doing without. So again, I'll talk generalities. And again, there may be supplements which are good for you when you're younger and become bad for you when you're older, and vice versa. And it's time for another disclaimer. Since many people in the anti-aging field set themselves up to make money by promoting and mar marketing or making things like supplements or specific treatments, my disclaimer is, I'm not making anything from this. I'm not selling anything. I have no financial interest in any, uh, sorry, that actually is no longer true. We bought shares in Afria, <laughs> cannabis producer. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I mean, my wife is on medical cannabis for her condition, and uh, she bought some, she was prescribed some from one company, and they didn't do such a good job. And then uh, got another prescription from Afria, and I said, wow, you know, the, the, they just looked after this so well. I said, well, that sounds like a good company. And I, if I'm going to buy shares, it's going to be in something. I, I'm a little like Warren Buffett. Buy something that you understand the business model, <coughs> and, uh, and better yet, if you know enough about it, I'm buy So. Uh, that's a disclaimer. I'm, I'm not earning any income from work in this field. I have no conflicts of interest other than possibly this African business. It's just occurred to me. Other things to avoid, uh, and we'll talk about these. And I'm going to start talking about them, and that, that is really difficult for me because it really upsets the order in which I like to do things. I like to keep in the sequence. But So Canada has outlaw, outlawed BPA, bisphenol A, in baby bottles for years. Okay. Why? Because it's known to be an es a hormone disruptor. And primarily it disrupts estrogen. So having little babies get uh, influences on their estrogen from BPA in their milk bottles, not such a good idea. So that's why it was banned. Now, Besides stimulating estrogen, BPA also stimulates insulin, and that's important here for reasons that you're all aware of now. Now, BPA is uh, ubiquitous in our environment because, you know all those receipts that you get that are printed on thermal printers? The, what makes the, the, the heat turn the paper dark is a coating of pure bisphenol A on at least one side of the paper. When heat hits that bisphenol A, it turns dark. Okay. And how many times a day do you handle a thermal uh, receipt? Okay. They're all over the place. So grocery stores, anytime you use a credit card or a debit card, uh, 
at the gas pump, bus and train tickets, parking tickets, boarding passes, lottery slips. They're printed almost all the time on thermal printers and they use BPA. So it's very, very hard to avoid. Now, uh, even worse, because we tend to, being good uh, consumers, we tend to recycle bits of paper, including these receipts. And in the recycling, they get in, into all sorts of other paper products, including paper currency, fortunately we're now on plastic, um, but food cartons, napkins, paper towels, toilet paper, they all have some BPA in them now. now so handling any of these products can cause a BPA. And who met, how many times do you use a thumb to go from one receipt to the other and then lick your mm -hmm. thumb, you know? I mean, lots of people do that. It's almost an unconscious habit. But it means that the BPA on your thumb not only does it get transmitted directly through your skin, but also you ingest it if you lick your thumb. And Greasy skin, including use of hand lotions, increases the absorption. Alcohol found in all of these uh, uh, hand sanitizers all over the place increases absorption. Hand washing barely removes it. So, uh, this is a problem. I couldn't leave that slide on long enough. So, BPA, which has been available and it's one of the most widely produced chemicals in the world. <coughs> Millions of tons annually of BPA are made. So it's all over in the environment and because it stimulates insulin secretion, is a BPA in our environment contributing to the obesity and type 2 diabetes epidemic in Western society? Not only Western society, all over the world. Blue light at night. Now, many studies have shown that exposure to light at night, for shift workers, for example, increases the risk for cancer, heart disease, obesity, and diabetes. And the effect is most pronounced for blue light of around 480 nanometer wavelength, because that is a frequency of light which uh, suppresses melatonin most strongly. And so, the effect of blue light is to suppress melatonin. So the melatonin has a major effect on circadian rhythms, among other things. But here's a little known fact. High melatonin levels suppress insulin, and vice versa. High insulin levels suppress melatonin. So if you're exposed to blue light at night, lowers melatonin level, which causes an increase in insulin secretion. Again. High insulin, we think, contributes to cancer, diabetes, and all these other things. So that may be why uh, night shift work is a problem. And exposure to blue lights at night, and computer screens, our, our little phones, our iPads, TVs uh, that are lit with LEDs, they have a high content of blue light. And the Apple products, and I think Android also, they now have something called night shift. So set, make sure that your phone or iPad is on night shift at night because they've actually taken out much of the blue light from the screen. So it's going to be better for your health. <clears throat> now, shift work. Actually, we've already touched on that, but also short sleep. Both of these conditions result in increased light exposure, thus less melatonin, and therefore higher insulin. <coughs> In female shift workers, nurses primarily, this has uh, been uh, widely studied, and the risk of breast cancer is increased by 40% in nurses who work night shift, compared to nurses who don't work night shift. 40%, that's a lot. There's also evidence for an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. Now, while insufficient sleep surely worsens our health, who knew that too much sleep can be bad for our health too? How would that work? Well, how can too much of anything be bad for you if you need it? It's a valid question to ask, right? Think about it. What happens to a premature baby that gets too much oxygen 
Anyone know? They develop blindness. It affects their retinas. So too much oxygen can be bad for you. What about too much sun? We need sun. It makes vitamin D in our skin. Yeah, and maybe skin cancer. So too much of anything that we need can be bad for us. Same thing for sleep. Yes, we need sleep. Too little sleep, as we've seen, is bad for our health. But so is too much sleep. And how does too much sleep affect us badly? Well, that's another area of research that I'm really interested in, but moved away from in recent years. But I've written a lot about this. I think we'll have to uh, share. We have time limitations okay. in this room. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to stop there. But I'm open to questions. Too much sleep does what? Yeah, I know that interests you. Right? Yeah, exactly. You can ask the question privately. Ask the question. So let's uh, thank our speaker first of all.